Today I just want to speak to you on the subject developing a God-given burden. Developing a God given burden. If you have your Bibles, turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. I'm not going to read the whole text, but I want you to read it tonight because I'm going to draw some things out of this text that are going to really help us to develop a God-given burden. I also want to thank the UTC South Africa. They're watching. My wife, sister Daniela, little Sierra. Hi, Dewey. Hi, Sierra. But today I want to speak to you for the next few moments. And I want to pray for some of you tonight is I believe that God could heal you if you came in hurting today, if you came in needing a miracle, is listen, we're not up here just shouting. We're not cheerleaders. We're not, we're not hype men. But we're filled with the unction of the Holy Ghost. And if your life is falling apart, listen, there is, there is healing here at the altar. There is deliverance here. There is a fresh anointing here. And so I want to encourage you at the conclusion of this sermon, we're going to open these altars. And whatever it is that you're facing, listen, God is here. God is near. Just draw close. Praise the Lord. The Word of God reads in Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 says, The word of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, it came to pass in the month of Chisel, the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brothers, came with the men of Judah and asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The walls of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates were burned with fire. Verse 4, so it was that when I heard these words that I sat down and wept, I mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you, God. We love you. And we thank you for this church, God. I feel that championship spirit just upon me today, God. And I pray that, Lord, you will anoint, God, my mouth, anoint this sermon. I pray for every listener, God, those that are watching online, those that are here. God, we ask you now that healing will go out, that hope will go out, that today we can be an encouragement through your word. So we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, we all say Give your neighbor a high five and you can be seated. Praise the Lord. Here in the text, we find the account of Nehemiah, an exiled Jew. He was now a cupbearer to the king of Persia, and he's living in a life of luxury. He's living in a life of honor. He's eating and drinking, rubbing noses with royalty. But all of a sudden, is something drastically changes him forever. A fellow countryman brings a disturbing report of the condition of his people and how the city he loved is completely destroyed. After this encounter, he's never the same. He became obsessed with the burden to do something about what God has shown him. And this morning, church, I want uh, this evening, church, I want to share with you is how to develop a God-given burden. You see, today we all have different jobs. We have different walks of life. But I believe every single one of you has been called for a purpose. You are marked by God. You're not here by accident. You're not here because your cousin invited you or because your husband is in the men's home. You are here because there is a specific purpose that God has separated you. He's carved out a certain plan for your life. All you got to do is catch that burden. We see here in the text that his people were in distress, meaning that they were in need of help because they were living in disappointment. Secondly, his people were living in survival mode. I don't like when Christians say, I'm just surviving. I think surviving should be a cuss word. See, God does not call us to be survivors. I know you like that show. Come on, Pastor Chris. <laughs> Survivor, come on, somebody. Strategy, field guide, come on now. 
But I don't think the God that we serve is a God that wants us just to survive. I believe God has raised up a church and has given a church power and has given a church influence not to survive but to thrive. And today, if you're just surviving Christianity, barely making it, oh, I got to go to a certain, no, that you're here because you're going to hear the word of the Lord, and when God speaks your name, you're never going to be the same. See, but God brought you here to VOSD to be trained to be a modern-day Nehemiah and rebuild the walls around the world. But you got to understand that God has a purpose for your life. You got to understand. I don't care what's happened to you. What people have done to you. I don't care who stole your EBT card. Come on somebody. I'm here to declare to you. That God has a plan for you. Are you with me? Come on somebody. See thirdly the city was broken down. And the gates were burned down with fire. See, when walls and gates are broken, it means that there's no safety, no protection, no place to cultivate your purpose, no place to preserve the legacy for the generation to come. See, this text is a modern-day illustration of our world today. Many of our inner cities of the world are broken down and burned with fire. We also see that Nehemiah was living in Shushan. Somebody say, Shushan. Come on, somebody. It was the capital city of the Persians. And he lived in a citadel, which means a fortified palace. See, but God is looking for deliverers that are not concerned with living in the palace, that aren't afraid to quit their job, that aren't afraid to sell their cars and to go to another country, even though it looks a little scary, even though you don't know the language, even though you don't know what you're going to eat, but that you will have a burden to make an impact wherever God sends you. There's three things that I want to talk about that helped Nehemiah develop a God-given burden for his people and his generation. The first thing that we see is that Nehemiah developed an inquisitive ear for the things of God. See, we must always be listening to what God is saying. Oh, don't act, don't act like you don't know what an inquisitive ear is. Come on, somebody. How many remember when mama was spanking your brother in the room? You were in the door listening with the glass. Oh, man, Julio's getting it right now. Come on, Julio. My, oh, man. Come on, somebody. How about when, when somebody's getting dealt with in the foyer? Come on. You're out there having your cup of coffee. Come on, your cup of fruit. And then you see somebody over there just, when the hand starts going like that, you know they're getting dealt with. Come on now. And all of a sudden, you got ultrasonic hearing. Come on. You're like, oh, man, what's going on over there? But I don't know, man, but so-and-so did something, and I know they're in trouble. <laughs> See, Nehemiah had an inquisitive ear. In other words, he was listening what, to what God was saying through his brother. And here I'm here, to, here today to let you know that God is calling you, that God is calling you to make an impact in the city, but will you open your ear? Will you open your ear to the nations? Will you open your ear to what God wants to do? I'm not the only one going to get sent out. Come on, somebody. Some of you are going to get sent out. But you got to open your ear. You got to unclog. Come on. You got to get that little Uzi Vert out of your head. You got to get Nicki Minaj out of your head. You got to get Drake out of your head. You got to cut off that sports feed because that's distracting you. You got to listen to the voice of God. But some of us, we have some modern-day Jonas in the house. You don't want to pray because you know what God's going to say. God's going to say, I want you to start that life group. I want you to move into the home. Quit your job. Come on, somebody. And move into the home to be a staff. Come on, somebody. Quit your job and, and go to the UTC. Come on, some of you young people. There's a gang in the house. Some of the gang, you got to start making plans now to go to the UTC. You got to get equipped. You got to get trained. You got to get developed. We need leaders, man. We need leaders to rise up and that could take their place in the vision. 
You can't be messing around, young people. You can't be catching, catching crushes on everybody. You can't be caught up on social media sliding in the DM. You got to be ready. You got to be separated. You got to say, God, what do you want from me? God, I'll give you everything. We need a generation that could hear the voice of God. God is saying, go to the UTC, go to the MTC, go to another country. See, God has called us to repair the walls of hope in the world, to have a mighty plan, to, to do mighty things for God. He doesn't want you to stay in life's luxuries. Come on, somebody. I wish I could get me some Yeezys. Come on, somebody. But I threw away that, that desire. I was a sneakerhead. I was probably one of the first sneakerheads in this church. But the sneaker didn't save me. The sneaker didn't do nothing for me. But it was God who put an anointing on my life. It was God. It was God and whatever I could give to God. Come on, young people. H&M. Come on, we don't need H&M models. We need men and women that are going to lay down their lives for Christ. God has called you to be an ambassador. Look to your neighbor and say, I'm an ambassador. See, 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. See, but some of us are trying to shake God off. How many of you ever had something stuck on your hand? You're trying to shake it. Shake off that, that little. You come on, somebody. Don't like you never pick your nose. Come on, shake it off. You're trying to shake God off. You're trying to shake them. God is saying, start that life group. Move into the home. Go to the UTC. Get close to your leader. But you're shaking it off. You're shaking it off. But God is not looking for people that shake it off. But you will listen to that voice and say, God, I'm listening. Somebody say, shake it off. Some of you got that Jeremiah spirit. Come on, somebody. You want to keep quiet. You don't want to talk about God. You've been disappointed in the house of the Lord. So you don't want to talk about it. Nobody's coming to your life group. So you don't even want to talk to, to the people about God. How I many know Jeremiah didn't have one single convert, but he listened to the voice of God. And God is not looking for people that have a popularity contest, but he's looking for obedient soldiers. He's looking for obedient men and women that can hear his voice. Can somebody say amen? See? Some of us got that selective hearing. Come on, how I, how I remember when mama say, throw the trash. But you're right there playing Mario. I'm almost to the next level. Mama, I'm on Madden. I'm on hyper beast mode. Don't want to throw out no trash. You can't be having selective hearing in the house of God. But you need to have an ear for God. And, and I pray that this generation and that this church, that you still have an ear for God. Whatever God asks. You know, you, you know uh, it's not always going to be a prophecy over the altar call. They're going to say, Sam, will you be a tin man? Come on, somebody. Sam, can you bring some hay bales for the, for, for the harvest festival? Will, will you go pass out some flyers? Come on, somebody. Will you join the prayer meeting at 5 a.m.? See, God is always calling He's not calling us to convenience and to comfort, but sometimes God is calling us to an uncomfortable position. I've learned in my life to be uncomfortable. Why? Because God is always moving, and I don't want to miss God. I want God. I want God to be close to me. I want God to speak to me as a friend. But we have to have an open ear. Somebody say, open your ear. Secondly, not only did he have an inquisitive inquisitive ear but he had an intimate cry see nehemiah took ownership for the cry of his people by becoming an intercessor see we need intercessors i'm not impressed by great preaching i'm not impressed impressed by <laughs> now 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 <laughs> that don't impress me shake your foot seven to get ready get ready get ready. i'm not impressed by that I'm impressed by people that have power because they've been on their knees. I'm not impressed by that. Don't do that. That's weird. I'm not impressed by all that. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. That, 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 don't, that don't impress me. That's just a 
that's just to keep your attention. But I'm impressed by somebody that knows how to get intimate with God. I'm impressed by somebody that can get in there. That can go not only 10 minutes, not only 20 minutes, not only 30 minutes. But I, I'm impressed by people that can pray all night. That are begging for an all night prayer meeting. That will make a way for a prayer meeting. See? We need people that have an intimate cry. There's a song going out that says, I don't really care if you cry. How many heard that one? Come on, somebody. Don't act like you don't hear that little Uzi Vert. Come on. I don't really care if you cry. Oh, my. All right. Come on, somebody. That's what the world is saying. I don't care if you cry. Don't cry. If you're scared, go to church. See, but I want to let you know, my friend, that there, that's the world's perspective. But God hears every cry and he catches every tear because we are of God. We are in God's house and there's an anointing when you let those tears go. God hears every cry. That's why we're in Africa. That's why we're in India. That's why we're in Indonesia. That's why we're in the Philippines. That's why we're trying to get into Namibia. That's why we're trying to get into Congo. Why? Because, because there's a cry going out. And God is looking for laborers. God is looking for laborers. Not laborers that can just get a nice plasma and get a nice sofa. No, God called you to bigger things than a sofa at Costco. Come on, somebody. It's your leather recliner with a cup holder on that. Come on, somebody. But if you got it like that, go, do your thing. Make a move. Come on, somebody. God cares about your cry. We need people that can cry out to God. We need men in the home that cry out to God. That you're not crying over a, a, a stinking peanut butter sandwich that you didn't get. That you're not crying because you didn't get seconds. But that you say, God, if I'm not worthy to get anything else, I'm fine. Why? Because there's a cry going on. Come on, somebody. I didn't get my visit, so I'm leaving. Brother, you didn't care about no visit back in the day. You didn't care about your old lady, about your kid. Now, all of a sudden, you got to leave because I got to be the man of my house, Pastor. And, I, you know, Brother Johnny, I just want to let you know I'm going to get a job at Costco with my primo now. And I'm going to do it right. Come on, somebody. I may have seen that post. I'm going to get a job at Costco. My mama showed me that one today. I'm going to get a job. I'm going to do good. Hey, bro, you could have all my sopas. Come on, somebody. Nah, man, you're in that home because God is trying to put something inside of you. God is trying to raise you up to be a missionary, to be a pastor, to be a leader that's going to take this church into the next dimension. But do you have a cry? See, his cry did three things. Number one, he repented for his past sins. When you cry out to God, you got to repent for the sins of your fathers, the sins of your generation. And you got to ask God to forgive you of the past. Number two is that in his prayer, as he cried out, he remembered the promises of God. And being out in another country, I can't call Pastor Al because he's asleep at that time. It's a whole different time zone. But all I got to do is cry out and remember the promises of God. When I don't have no money, when I don't know what to do, all I could do is remember and say, God, you called me, God. You're the one that touched me. You're the one that rescued me. You're the one that's delivered me, God. So if you called me, if you promised me, then I can't give up. See? And thirdly, he requested favor over the burden of God that God placed in his heart. See, don't move without the favor of God upon your life. You can cry out all you want, but don't move until the favor of God is on your life. That's one thing I've learned. I remember there was a time, and Pastor, I hope you don't mind I share this, but there was a time. When Pastor was in the hospital and, and he was there with his, with his baby and he was, he was praying and believing for a miracle. And then there was opportunities coming my way. There was opportunities. And, and I was out in the parking lot. And I didn't like the parking lot too much at times. And it wasn't a glamorous position. And people were calling me and saying, Brother Sam, would you like to be a part of this team? And no disrespect to those leaders. But I thank God that I didn't just shoot to any old little opportunity that I remembered. I remembered. I want my pastor's blessing. And I thank God today that I stayed faithful in that parking lot even when my feet hurt and I didn't feel good because now, my friend, 
God has me in Cape Town, South Africa, and I'm running a UTC. We need leaders that have the favor of God on your life. That you have favor. Man, everywhere you go, there's favor. That there's favor. There's favor. You got to follow the favor. You stay close to your pastor. I don't care what they offer you. I don't care what slick preacher comes up here and tries to offer you a position. You stay loyal to your soil. You stay, oh, you don't got to, we don't take up pledges in our church. You just drop what you want in the basket. No, you stay loyal. This is our house. This is our house, baby. This is our house. This is where God raised me up. This is where God's going to raise you up. This is where God's going to raise your kids. This is where God's going to raise up some world takers. Somebody say favor. And the last thing is Brother Matthew comes to the keyboard. Is not only did he have an inquisitive ear. Did he have an inquisitive uh, Did he have a... Uh, <laughs> Did he have an intimate cry? But he also had impossible faith. See, Nehemiah had faith for impossibilities. In the natural, I don't know what your situation is, my friend. You see me up here all decked out in this African attire. And you say, oh, man, he must be blessed. See? But you don't know my story. You see the glory, but you don't know my story, man. You don't know what I've been through. We need a people that have impossible faith, man. And I know our people. This is my house. This is, this is, this is where I'm from. And I know that there's impossible situations in your life. I know that the enemy's on your back. I know that your kids are acting up. I know the doctor might have given you a negative report. But I want to proclaim to you it's time to get back to that impossible faith. It's time to get back. Remember that time when you first got saved and you would believe God for anything. You believe God for shoes. You believe God for groceries. You believe God if the pledge went out. You believe. Why? Because there was an impossible faith. There was a seed of faith in your spirit. And some of us have lost our faith. We've lost our faith. We're, we're, we're not believing. Oh, well, I'm not part of the gang, so maybe God is done with me. No. We need the pioneer generation. There's an oldie that says, stay in my corner. Some of you OGs, you need to stay in our corner. Don't give up. Because if it wasn't for some of you OGs, when I was in that parking lot, that you said God is just training you, that God is building you, I would have left. But some of you need to, need to stay in our corner. Some of you need to be cut, man. And train the Johnny boys and the, and the Julians and, and the, the Leslies. And you need to train them and begin to prepare them. And say, Miha, this is how you do it. This is how you work with these ones. This is how you work with those. This is how you do it. This is how you run a home. You need to stay in our corner. God is not done with you yet. God is not done with you. There's a new season. There's a new anointing on your life. See, the world is throwing away everything that we hold dear to. And we need some of you OGs to stay in our corner and say, get in there, mijo, don't you give up. Get in there, mijo, don't you dare give up. We're counting on you. We're counting on you. Stay in our corner. Stay, we need you. Some of you, Uncle Louis, stay in our corner. Don't you dare give up. We need you. Pastor Concha, we need you. The more I grow as a leader, the more I see how much there is to learn. Sometimes, man, I don't know what to do. But I just remember, what would Pastor Conchi do? Come on, somebody. What would Pastor Al and Sister Georgina do? Come on, what would Johnny do? And I begin to glean off of my past victories and my, and my, my uncles, and my spiritual uncles in the Lord. And that kept me going when I wanted to throw in the towel. And that's how Nehemiah was. He looked and he seen greatness the bible says he was in the palace and i want to remind you victory outreach san diego that we need to be a people that have impossible faith you need to believe god for greater things you need to believe god for your city you need to believe god for your family you need to believe god for your healing you need to believe god for the world don't waste your faith on small stuff don't waste your faith on, God, I need a parking ticket paid off. No, that's not faith. 
we need people that have big faith. They say, Pastor, I want to I wanna step out and, and, and who's in Oceanside? Who's in Claremont, Pastor? I want to break open something. Who, who's in Imperial Beach? Our pastor broke it open, but, but who's the one that's going to carry that thing? Who's going to take it? Who has impossible faith? Oh, I'm working overtime, Pastor. I can't do it. I'm too young. Come on, gang. I'm too young, Pastor. I don't know how to do it. No, I'm in the home, Pastor. I can't do it. Who's going to do it? We need some foolish faith here, man. That's all. I am just a fool, man. I'm just a fool. Put me in a clown suit, I'll do it. Put me up here to MC an auction, I'll do it. Put me to, to help in the sound, I'll do it. Put me to stack chairs, I'll do it. We need some people that have impossible faith. Understanding will come later, but you say yes. You say yes to that impossible situation. You see, Nehemiah's enemies, you can later read the story, but what they didn't understand is that Nehemiah had an unfair advantage. And Victory Outreach San Diego, I want to declare to you that you have an unfair advantage. You have an elder here. You have a great pastoral staff here. You have an unfair advantage. We are one of the top leading churches in the ministry. And so you have an unfair advantage. And it would be foolish of us not to take advantage of that advantage. See, he was in the palace. He was exposed to greatness. He was exposed to great things. And that's what we need. We need people. You're in. You're, I didn't know how much I had to. I was out in Africa and I was getting squeezed. And they began to say, hey, what do you think, Sam? And I'm like. And then I remembered the unfair advantage, Pastor. I remember the unfair advantage that I had. Why? Because I was trained in a gym at 4235 National Avenue. And I was here trained on Wednesday. I was here trained on a Sunday. I was here trained at a prayer meeting. I was trained because I had an unfair advantage. I want you to look to your neighbor and say there's greatness inside of you. There's greatness inside of you. I want you to prophesy to them and say there is greatness inside of you. Look them in the eye and say there is greatness inside of you. There is greatness inside of you. Listen to me. You're a barrier breaker. You are a barrier breaker. You're a builder. You're a city taker. You're a soul winner. You're a pastor. You're a missionary. Oh, I don't know if you could feel it in your... But you're a missionary. Look to your neighbor and say, you're a missionary. Doesn't that sound good? You're not a janitor. You're not a cashier. You are a missionary. Come on, somebody. You're not a school teacher. You're a missionary. See, because of Nehemiah's prayer and his impossible faith, he was able to believe God for the impossible something that took so long to destroy because of his impossible faith he was able to rebuild it in 52 days and listen friend brother sister uncle auntie young person young adult men's home women's home parking lot if you could hear me <laughs> Is I don't know what your impossibility is but tonight I have faith inside of me for a miracle they're going to sing this song and if you need a fresh touch of God if you just needed somebody to breathe life back into you then listen if you need a healing in your body I want you to come to the front if you need healing I want you to come I want you to come I want you to come now now the Holy Spirit is here the Holy Spirit is some of you need to go to the UTC the Holy Spirit